Thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. Our next speaker is Mr. Sachin Gaur from India-EU ICT Standards Collaboration Project. Mr. Sachin is a double master's in mobile security and cryptography from Aalto University, Finland and University of Tartu, Estonia. He has been a keen technology innovator with 11 technology patents granted at USPTO. He has also contributed to chapters in three books on innovation and healthcare. He received Top 10 Innovators Award in India under India Innovation Growth Program. He is active in the space of mobile technologies and information security in the areas related to ICT and healthcare. In the past, he has worked with organizations like Adobe India, CER in Geneva and Alto University, Finland. So, may I request you to deliver your talk on IoT Security, a Comparative Analysis. So good evening everyone, I promise I will not bore you and I have been allocated 30 minutes so I will try to do in 10 minutes. So that's the first good news. So, yeah. so uh, you know much have been already said about the topic and uh, you know I studied uh, security and I, I would like to tell you this story, uh, you know, when uh, you are sometimes you're not present with the situation, but it hits you on the face. Mm -hmm. So one day my professor told me, Sachin, uh, have you tried, uh, you know, photocopying a euro currency note? Uh, I said, no. I mean, it never occurred to me that I could make more euros, you know, without the euro bank, for example. So he took me very quickly and we put the euro note and... Can anybody guess what was the output? All black. So it was a black, black printout, which means that the, the currency note had certain signatures which was told to OEM and OEM, let's say, would behave in a certain way and it will not produce the output, desired output. And it so happens that the machine will also call the police, right? <laughs> so that's in Finland already 15 years back. Right? So sometimes, you know, we can have uh, foresight in security and, you know, we can think about topics, you know, in that way. And I was amazed, uh, you know, as a student, I, I didn't know all this back then. And then I was once listening to, uh, you know, the head of Europol, who was once visiting our university, and he said, you know, the first thing that we go and investigate uh, in a setup is a Xerox machine. So again, the Xerox machine comes into the story. So the, why they go and look into the Xerox machine? Because every Xerox machine has a hard drive. So everything that you copy gets stored into it. So if they want to know, you know, what is the malicious stuff you are doing, you know, you go and, you know, look at the hard disk in the Xerox machine. And since, uh, you know, I studied security, I am a bit notorious. So I was thinking that, you know, if... Uh, uh, you know, I have to steal something from someone. I have to just show up as a maintenance guy, let's say at CDOT, and ask, sir, can I, uh, you know, do the AMC for your Xerox machine? You know, take the, change the hard disk, give them a free hard disk, and take the old one with the data, right? Maybe in the army they will not allow because, you know, they have, they're very clear about the physical uh, part of it, but maybe in organizations like corporates, they might allow. I mean, just a test question to you. Uh, if you were given a USB drive in this conference, how many of would you have used it? Right? So there are some hands going up, which shows that, you know, uh, you get a freebie, you will use it, right? So that would have been my way to get a malware to you, right? Or if I cannot give you in a conference, I would just drop in your parking lot and give it to you, right? But anyways, I, I think I'm too much digressing now from my topic. I think I have your attention now. So this part was to get your attention. 
And <laughs> so, you know, I recently bought an Alexa device, uh, Amazon Alexa, for my mother. Uh, so how many of you have a voice-activated device at your home? Some of you, right? So I wrote a paper in 2008 uh, because my mother was always my motivation. She didn't have a phone. She doesn't have a phone today. And I could never get a, her a phone, right? But she can call me today, right now, using Alexa. The problem is that she doesn't want to learn technology. And she can just say to Alexa, call Sachin. Right? And Alexa uh, can call me, can call my wife, who is, let's say, on Skype. So she doesn't even know Skype. And that device is 1900 rupees, right? The amount that I bought. So my prediction is five years down the line, we will not have a mobile phone as we know. Because the price of the technology, which is voice activated, it so retrofits into our environment that we don't need, you know, a clunky device which is captivating most of us in a room like this today. So that's my prediction that in five years down the line, we will not have a mobile phone, right? So why I'm telling you all this? The reason is that Amazon has sold 60 million voice activated devices in US alone in a population of 300 million. So every family in US has a voice activated device. And I can go, so most of the time in my house, the Alexa device is not plugged in. Because being security conscious, I don't want it to listen to my conversation. So I have told my parents to so plug it when you want to use it. Because I can go to the dashboard and listen to the, all the audio files. So that's just for your context. So let me come back to this presentation. I'll be very quick as I promised. So I'll just tell you some quick uh, things maybe which uh, have been not covered. So there's this IRTF document 8576 and ANISA report from 2017 and a NIST uh, document which just came out in August 2019. So that's what I will cover. So uh, I was uh, reading about uh, you know these documents and uh, one of the things that I kind of understood and I was borrowing from also from previous speakers, I think security in some context in IoT can also mean quality, right? So if I buy a higher quality device, it may mean, you know, more secure. And I think why, uh, you know, quality is difficult in IoT. So there is this paper by Ross Anderson, which says why information security is hard and economic perspective. So I think it all boils down to money, you know, and uh, we can think about these statements. So I have just written the papers and the titles. And the other one is market for security product is a market where both buyer and seller have incomplete information, right? So I have done a hospital audit, the best in the India. We have able to compromise all of the devices. The reason is not that I'm genius. The reason is they run on Windows XP, which means what? that if you have an X-ray machine, you have an MRI machine, and it runs to and does what it's supposed to do, you're not going to throw it away, right? So as a buyer, as a hospital, they didn't know all this, that 10 years down the line, Microsoft will not support the operating system, right? So it's not just the, you know, we as buyer, it's also the manufacturer, you know, they are at totally at loss you know, in the field of security, especially true for IoT, right? Then another statement, this is a statement by which Richard Stallman likes, trusted computing as treacherous computing. And this can, can be a controversial statement for you guys, because some of you might uh, have to worry about it. But I was, uh, you know, in general collecting information on this topic of IoT security. So I wrote to my friend Aurelien in Eurecom in France, and he sent me a paper immediately. And this paper advocates this key idea, design for security testing and design for user trust. So for example, when we buy a device today from market, uh, and there was a question uh, raised on trust. So as a security researcher, you would like to trust something which you could test. And most of the time, security in devices like this comes by obscurity. So they don't want to tell us anything. They don't want us to, you know, look what's under the hood. So I think from a policy perspective, sir, when some of you are making policies, you know, you should consider that, you know, what 
are the you know main criteria that when a manufacturer is making something let's say you know somebody saying this is a secure bootloader can i put another operating system and it will still work with that bootloader for example so many of the uh, you know manufacturers use this uh, security premise to block anybody else to install something on top of that device you know so that's what uh, you know i could gather from these research papers and this is a statement i would just like you to reflect on that uh, you know we are surrounded by devices we don't know uh, who is able to access it who is able to perform software update a topic came recently you know uh, i think i have shared this with mr nath we were investigating a petrol pump crime here in india and uh, so this was 9000 petrol pumps in uttar pradesh which is the state where i belong to so all of those 9000 petrol pumps they do delivery short delivery of 250 ml petrol on every 5 liters how does it work so there is a company which makes these machines and there are employees of that company which run organized crime so they come with their own firmware and they plug into the machine and after that firmware update the machine short delivers 250 ml of uh, petrol right so if you add up number you realize that the guy who is running the show is soon going to be pablo escobar because he is going to have lot of money right so he they have lot of money so when we were investigating that crime and i was thinking you know what can you do and you know if you tell anybody in india that this petrol pump delivers less petrol nobody is startled nobody is surprised and i i wonder why i am surprised if i tell anybody this nobody is surprised so people accept that fraud is going to happen fraud is bound to happen but imagine a population of 1.3 billion people if you do steal one paisa from everyone and if that one person keeps getting all the money they are going to be richer than government at some point so why we cannot take action against that company because there is no law which governs you know around this uh, meteorological act which covers software tampering so that was one of our observation when we got went into the detail of this uh, uh, topic so software update on iot devices is a very very uh, sensitive topic and at least in the case of petrol pump and many other areas i can give you more uh, offline examples where i can see billions of dollars being you know stolen so i'll not talk about this airport example mr uh, sharma already mentioned so uh, as as i mentioned that i'll quickly cover these two three documents so this is rfc 8576 and it mentions this life cycle of an iot device from manufacturing installation commissioning to let's say you know re ownership and recommissioned i think mr sharma mentioned about uh, re ownership for example so this is the whole uh, life cycle and you know what are the threat this document mentions vulnerable software we know all about that privacy threat cloning of things malicious substitution of things eavesdropping attack man in the middle attack firmware attack extraction of private information routing attack elevation of privilege denial of service so if you look at world over the last 3 4 years what is the you know the biggest threat among these any anybody what makes people worried most so in my my thinking it's denial of service so mirai botnet brought down the us internet you know almost so i think at least from a us perspective you know this denial of service using uh, you know and i think what mr nath uh, uh, hinted on from a liability perspective that when you buy a cheaper device low quality device it's actually a bot for somebody else and you can bring down a nation you know using those devices so so this document also talks about these three questions and i will not go into the detail but just raising those questions so how to avoid vulnerabilities in iot devices that can lead to large scale attacks so maybe these are questions directed to mr nath how to detect sophisticated attack against iot devices and i believe sir we should organize you know more open hackathons where people should do pen testing you know especially for critical devices i think 
around election time, you know, we keep getting confusing reports about EVMs, right? Even till date, I mean, uh, as a citizen, we, we don't know, uh, you know, what is the mechanism, for example. How to prevent developers from exploiting known vulnerabilities? So, for example, US FDA has a post-device marketing management framework wherein they say if they have made a linear scale of 1 to 5, if they say that, okay, if your vulnerability is above 4, you have to recall the device. So, Abbott recalled half a million pacemakers recently, right? You cannot put a pacemaker in somebody's body and tell them, boss, you are okay, you are fine, but we need to do a software update, so come to hospital, right? And who will bear the cost of, you know, that software update, for example. So coming now to the ENISA document that was uh, the IRTF document. So this is again, you know, a list of IoT uh, assets. Just a quiz here. So uh, ENISA hired a bunch of experts and they did a survey. Where is the threat? So anybody, I have my next slide which gives the answer. So where in this IoT uh, framework do you think the experts sensed most threat? Anybody? Theory? You want to take a guess? So it was sensors. And, and we learned, uh, uh, you know, about a sophisticated attack. I don't want to again, uh, you know, reveal the details. But it killed 60 people in India. And it was a thermostat, you know, which was a boiler thermostat. So if you mess up with a thermostat of a boiler, it can actually kill people on shop floor. So now there's a doubt whether it was a cyber attack or it was a real, I mean, it was just a malfunctioning of a boiler sensor. But sensors, as per this ENISA work, is the where, you know, the most uh, amount of threat lies. And what is good thing about this document, this is a baseline security recommendation for IoT. So this kind of work is directed for manufacturers of IoT. So it lists down uh, best practices. I have not gone into the detail. I have just taken the topics under which the best practices are mentioned, right? I'm not even going to read them out. You can stare at them. Why I'm showing it to you, every, each one of these headings, they have given exact HC standard or, you know, the IATF or whatever. So if you're interested, you can actually go and look at this publicly available document. So now I come to the next, uh, you know, uh, document 8259. This is released on July 31st. So the good news is, maybe my Etsy friends will be very happy. So the NIST document is referring the ENISA document and the Etsy, uh, you know, technical specifications a lot. So uh, what does, uh, I mean, the, in the crux, this NIST document talks about, I have just copy pasted here. So you can again look at it. But in detail, it talks about these six things. It talks about device identification. It talks about device configuration. It talks about data protection. It talks about logical access to interfaces. It talks about software and firmware update and cybersecurity event logging. And I think uh, the last part, maybe I'll just uh, take a minute here. I think long back I had a discussion with Mr. Nath about this uh, event logging. I think some of the you know, pending acts like DISHA, Digital Information Security Healthcare Act, talks about a hospital you know, uh, that they should have an audit trail of a crime. And I was sitting and I think Mr. Nath was there and I was sitting with a judge from Tamil Nadu uh, court. And she said, Sachin, we don't understand all this. You should organize a training program on cyber crime. Because if you understand from a judge perspective, maybe Mr. Vipin Tyagi, it is easy for you and you know, other technocrats here to understand the details of a cyber crime. But how, what do you produce in the, you know, the, the court, which is treated as an evidence? And I was uh, talking with Mr. Nath uh, that time, and I think he was proposing that you, know, you could use blockchain uh, to, to uh, store the logs. And I was also thinking, you know, in a similar way, let's say if we can make a federation, let's say in a hospital scenario, we can have many hospitals, they can come together and put a blockchain together, they can encrypt their logs and send it to that one blockchain. 
So when a crime happens, and let's say a hospital has to produce evidence, then the court of law can actually refer that blockchain and ask for the, pri I mean, the hospital to decrypt the logs, and those uh, logs can be, you know, non-reputable in in case of the court. Maybe just a suggestion here, but I think this event logging uh, can be tampered with easily, and uh, that is something. Uh, so this is my last slide. So. My understanding is there are at least half a dozen uh, IoT security framework available. I didn't even dare to look at all of them, but some of them say that they don't, don't cover hardware, some, they, some say they only cover hardware. So I think if I were to do a mapping of the length and breadth of this uh, you know, security issues in IoT, it will take me a few months to cover all the aspects. And uh, I think I come to bigger question uh, like uh, just borrowing Mr. Vijay Madan's example of using aeroplane or the airline industry that we just board the aircraft without checking, you know, the nitty gritties. So how do we bring trust? So some of the research papers, they were talking about, you know, uh, security classification was one example mentioned by TEC. Another example was labels. So so when we buy medicine from the counter, it says this will expire on XYZ date. So when did we buy a mobile phone which said that this will expire on XYZ date, right? In, in, in technology world, we buy products where they don't come with an expiry date, we just throw them when the company stops supporting them. Especially think from a public procurement perspective, you are about to buy a device at a cheaper cost, but it is coming with an OS which the company will stop supporting in one year from now. And you are locked down with that device for another 10 years. So maybe you want to buy something which is up to date and has a longer expiry date. So I think this kind of uh, thing can come from a, you know, uh, a policy perspective that devices could come with these kind of expiry date labels so that you know, the buyer is much more aware. And, uh, Another thing I didn't uh, mention, maybe this is an idea for Mr. Nath, that, uh, for example, in our office, we were using a Shodan account to monitor and investigate, you know, what kind of devices are available that we can penetrate. So I don't know, maybe we should do proactive monitoring, you know, using such search engines. And uh, maybe that is one way, because I remember, you know, uh, like website defacement is a common thing. Uh, whenever something happens with our neighbors, you know, somebody will deface our website, we will deface their websites. So I realized that it's a job of people who copy paste the code, you know. So what I did, I searched in Google with the same piece of HTML. So I could discover more websites which are defaced. So I called up Ministry of Corporate Affairs, hey, your website is defaced and they didn't even know about it. Because that website was defaced at, you know, not at the home page. So I thought of a, you know, so I thought of writing a paper, which is that, okay, we can go to search engines and a search engine, uh, you know, for them, uh, website defacement is not a crime. You know, it's like, you know, uh, somebody is putting in HTML and saying, you know, X, Y, Z, Zindabad. But we can give that piece of code to Google and say that as soon as you see this on internet, just tell us. So that embarrassment, that political embarrassment is saved you know, it's not there for one day, maybe it can be there for a minute, for example. So that's what I mean by, you know, capability to monitor and proactive mitigation of threats. And I think the uh, last thing I would just like to point out is that, uh, for example, in healthcare in a hospital, or let's say in army, they have something called as SOP, standard operating procedures. I think uh, most of the work that we are talking about here is not talking about standard operating procedure. So apart from the technical part, how do you onboard or how do you procure a device and how do you, you know, decommission it? So I think you mentioned about capabilities in your talk. So I would just say that security, uh, I mean, there's no end to learning technology and there's no end to, you know, I think we could learn something from the army because it's more about culture. So I think building security culture is an answer to that is building standard operating procedures. So if I was asking this crowd who would take a pen drive from me and put it into their computer, so in army they remove the USB port 
altogether. So even if you get the USB, you will not be able to put it. But I think if you get a USB, would you put it in your computer? Is not about technology. So my points are over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your fascinating views on various IoT security perspectives. Ladies and gentlemen, considering the time constraints, we hereby conclude this session. We don't have time for questions now. We would like to thank our eminent speakers for their enriching talks. May I now request Mr. Jayan Bhatnagar, Director CDOT, to present a token of thanks and gratitude to our esteemed panelists. Mr. Vipin Tyagi, Executive Director CDOT. <laughs> Mr. Narendra Nath, Joint Secretary, National Security Council Secretariat, Government of India. Professor Thierry Monte, National Center for Scientific Research. <laughs> Mr. S. K. Sharma, Deputy Director General, Telecommunication Engineering Center. <laughs> Mr. Sachin Gaur, India EU ICT Standards Collaboration Project. We thank all our eminent speakers once again. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall now convene for the next session immediately. We won't have the tea break. Yeah. Tea would be served after the conclusion of the program. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, a couple of things. You know, one is, you know, uh, we are coming over uh, uh, security strategy 2020, you know. We have the security policy that's come out in 2013. So we felt it's the right time and then the task force has been formed. And we are having a series of meetings every Friday at 3 o'clock. We have a series of presentations from the stakeholders about what they feel should be part of the security strategy for the country. So, you know, if uh, any of you have suggestions or anything, you can get in touch with me. And uh, we can organize a you know, session where you could give your views on what should be part of the security strategy. Yeah, and to answer to some of the things that you've said, yes, I mean, uh, those are things that are in consideration. There are certain projects which are taking, especially regarding, you know, finding out the vulnerabilities. You know, you do a proactive check and then fire, try to fix that. That is one of the things at, across, at the national scale. Yeah. Okay. And I think you have an agenda to throw ETSI out of business because if, if you do all, everything informally through SOPs and all of that, right? What will happen to the standards? No, no, no. So if you have a blockchain connectivity everywhere, and then that is going, that should be part of the standard, you know, so that everybody does it the same way. The audit is possible, like you said. I was just joking. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is centered on IoT use cases and 1M2M. I would like to request the esteemed members of this panel to please take their respective seats on the dais.
The panelists for this session are Ms. Margot Dorr, Director, Strategy Development, European Telecommunications Standards Institute, Mr. Christoph Collinet, Smart City Project Manager, Bordeaux Metropole, Mr. Binoy Gopal, Associate Director, Intelligent Transportation and Networking Section, Center for Development of Advanced Computing, CDAC, Mr. Sharad Arora, Founder and Managing Director, Sensorized Digital Services Private Limited, Mr. Sri Ganesh Rao, Managing Director, Caligo Technologies, Mr. Prasad Parshuraman, CEO, Pyrox ICT Private Limited. I would now like to hand over the stage to Ms. Margot Dorr for further proceedings. Good afternoon. Thank you for having stayed that late and accepting to skip the coffee break. It's going to be tough for us because the last session was quite exciting and interesting, so we're going to try and, and make this end of the session a little bit different. There will not be presentations. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a different format. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce briefly the session, and then the speakers will have uh, two minutes to present, to make a liminary statement, and then we'll proceed with questions and answers, including from the floor, by the way, to make it more uh, lively. Um, it's interesting that we end this two days conference with use cases, because usually use cases is, is what happens at the beginning. <laughs> they, express, they express a need, they express a problem statement, and this is how, this is how it starts. Use cases also uh, trigger uh, developments, developments at technical level in order to put together some solutions, development of uh, services and applications, and indeed uh, development of standards. Um, last but not least, the use cases are what start seeding the ecosystem and, and trigger the, 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 the virtuous circle of growth. So actually, everything starts with ecosystem, with the use cases. And at all those levels, be it um, uh, the problem statement, the develop technical development, service development, and so forth and so on, uh, uh, standardization is present to engineer interoperability and portability and reusability, et cetera. So we are, we are right in the middle of the subject here. Um, in fact, uh, yes, standardization without good use cases is, is often a, a a solution uh, looking for a problem. We have some of these on the shelves. Every standard organization has some of these. So use cases are quite, quite important. On the other hand, we heard for the last uh, two days that uh, uh, smart cities are a combination of different use cases and services addressing a variety of needs. And, and all of them, in their own capacity, contribute to making smart cities, i.e., an environment which is better living. And uh, the question that this panel will address is uh, how can standardization help de-silo this service? We've heard that quite often during these last two days. Does standardization help scale up and develop profitable ecosystems? Uh, is standardization a must for people who have a uh, use case, a good idea, a service, and application in mind? And if yes, if it is a must, is the road well paved? Do standard organizations do enough to, uh, 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 let's say, bridge the awareness gap between startups and, and standardization? And last but not least, what is or should be the role of policymakers in all this big um, ecosystem? So to answer these questions much more specifically, we have here a very uh, distinguished panel. And we decided at lunch, uh, after quite some deliberation, <laughs> to, <laughs> to go from specific to general. So we're going to start with uh, the, the uh, Prasad, who is in the business, he will explain this much better than I do, of uh, fire readiness monitoring. Uh, then we'll go with Benoit, who will talk about transport and intelligent transport system, traffic management, uh, uh, and smart traffic light is with CDAC. Um, then uh, we'll have Sharad, sorry, Sharad, talking about virtual sims to connect dynamically to different uh, uh, providers. I'm, I hope I got this all right. <laughs> and uh, then um, Sri Ganesh, 
Got it right? Uh, we'll talk about big uh, data analytics, which is not a use case, but it's very interesting because this is where it gets horizontal. And you have to, you have to, the, the, the beauty of it all is how, how can you make sure you get the, the benefits of, of aggregating data that comes from different, uh, um, not only devices, but services, and also non-IoT data. We heard some of this in this, in this panel. Um, this is one of the, the, the things which will be also interesting. And last but not least, Christophe, whom you've, uh, you, whom you've heard from, uh, which is uh, um, working in the metropole of Bordeaux, which is a big city, big and very nice city, who has implemented some of this. So we'll go from, from here to that with a number of questions. So the rule of the game, gentlemen, is that you have three minutes, absolute maximum, to make a liminary statement, and then we'll take it from there. And Prasad, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk about fire. So maybe we all get a little bit refreshed with this word because we have to be a, a bit very energetic about this aspect of our daily lives. Fire is a very victimized field. And the good news is 1M2M, as per me, after putting up 22 years in the field of fire protection, having installed something like 30,000 fire alarm systems and having done something like 200 projects in various verticals, power, steel, residential, commercial, large, la large projects, some of the most significant projects of our country, like the largest blast furnace, etc. So what has happened is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the, la the last speaker was talking about the device life cycle. <laughs> the fire device life cycle is like this. So the device has to be such that it doesn't fail because it's, it has to be a self-monitored system. So huge amount of standardization on product. So the product has to be worth its weight in gold. So standard, 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 standard for everything, standard for cabling, standard for how to connect, standard for, for the plastic, standard for everything, and stringent standards, stringent test procedures. So the product comes into the market after heavily standardized, heavily cost, stand, in a highly, highly costly standardization process, and then comes and gets deployed, and after that it's forgotten. <laughs> there is no, no decommissioning, there is no service, there's no follow-up. And yesterday in the, in the session, somebody said that 1M2M, the vision of 1M2M, or one of the very important visions of 1M2M is to pave a platform for excellence in services. So that's the hope which we have from 1M2M, and I'm highly excited about this. So very briefly I'll cover, there is a fire detection system, there's a fire extinguisher, portable fire extinguisher cylinder which you all see, and then you have this fire protection system, these sprinklers and hydrants and and the hose reels which we carry and we start the water and it comes on. So all these items have numerous components which are manufactured by numerous vendors. And then there's a system integrator who puts it all together. And then there's a consultant who recommends the way it has to be put up. After it is put up, the fire officer is called for an NOC. The fire officer is generally a firefighting expert. He's not an engineer or an engineering expert. Generally, he's a firefighting expert in the sense that if there is a fire, he is responsible for saving lives. So they come and put it up and they give the NOC and then walk out. Bombay alone has something like 4 lakh buildings. That is half a million buildings, okay, in uh, more international terms. Half a million buildings and each building to inspect on an annual basis would take at least two days. So we can just imagine the amount of resources required for such inspection. So that's not possible, and because of that, day after the day, there are accidents. The systems installed don't work. We would have spent more than the budget of plumbing and electrification put together in installing fire protection systems. But still, the systems don't work. because Not because people just don't want it to work, because it's a complicated system. These are very large systems. The pump room of this particular infrastructure would be 100 times the magnitude of the water system put up in this building. The fire pump room would be 100 times that magnitude. The minimum pump starts at 100 HP. So 1M2M for the first time, so uh, there's a huge story around it as to why these are not maintained and why we are losing one life every, every half an hour. 
that is 48 lives per 24 hours in India alone due to fire accidents. So now because of 1M2M and the vision that it has thrown up for us, for just like, you know, it took me one, one year to at least get a brief concept of 1M2M, what it can do. Initially, it seemed to be very simple and very, a very straightforward kind of a thing. But after a year, I realized the potential. So for us, it is a journey from emergency, mo emergency reporting to fire readiness monitoring. So the building standards, the National Building Code has envisaged that every building should be fire ready. If there is a fire incident, the installed systems should work and they should take care of that fire. But whenever a layman or anybody imagines fire, emergency, they always think about fire brigades coming in. Whereas the national standards codes or the national building codes have not envisioned it like that. 1M2M provides a beautiful platform. So people were talking about this interoperability. I am talking about interoperability within the domain of fire. Whether fire detection, fire uh, extinguishers and the pump rooms are maintained or not, this level of interoperability itself was not there in our field. So everything yesterday what Pamela Madam had uh, said or uh, you know, the, 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 the flip side of non-standardization is highly applicable to the business of fire, at least in India. So for me, we have defined a platform with, the, with help from CDOT also and we put up a, a server which now comprehensively monitors the fire readiness of buildings without manual intervention. So the systems perform self-check and give you an analyzed data as to what is the level of fire readiness of your building and of your infrastructure, your home or office. So this is a new paradigm which we would like to bring in. Till the time whenever there was emergency reporting, it, it, whenever there was discussion about connecting and central command center and everything, fire has always been confused with disaster management. The disaster would not occur at all if the readiness is monitored. So 1M2M has beautifully provided that platform for us and uh, it has provided it in the most affordable manner. So some of the speakers have said the cost of standardization and other things. I say 1M2M is the only standard that comes without a designated hardware. So all standards still today which I have seen in the last 20 years take BACnet or any other standardization effort right from the age of 485 or LAN, it comes with a dedicated piece of hardware that you have to buy this LAN chip. So there is a cost of standardization there. But here, 1M2M is only about making things talk from the software point of view. So the, the, the migration from, for anybody, so I don't think cost as any excuse of migration for not migrating into a 1M2M standard. I say that it's a beautiful platform and the field of fire readiness monitoring, if I may propose it's a new field, fire readiness monitoring would be highly benefited from this initiative. And in that same vein, I, I thank all of you for bringing this beautiful standard to the world. Thank you very much. I forgot two things important. One is to introduce you and to give your bio, but you sort of have with your, your, your speech. Uh, and to say that your demo is in the uh, demonstration area uh, on the uh, CDOT stand, actually, yeah. and, and it's a very interesting uh, it's a very interesting demo. I encourage everyone in the room to uh, to see it. Um, we're gonna go. Uh, we'll have some questions afterwards, maybe. Yeah, Would yeah you, sure. Yeah. You prefer? Um, no, I, I'm gonna ask you one question already, because what you said means there is a lot of different uh, stakeholders in your um, food chain, if I may yeah. say. So, um, how do you uh, how does the, the, the you said you, 1M2M was a beautiful standard, uh, that's, um, we appreciate that. How does it help put this together and how do you get all these people to talk together? Because this is very often the, the, the major issue to manage to, uh, to, get to, all, to get all the people on the food chain to actually talk together and work together. Thank yeah. you. So when it came to fire alarms, it was to a certain extent integrated, that is the Fire alarm manufacturer would provide the detector, the panel, the hooter, the strobes and other stuff. But when it came to fire protection, which actually is going to save a life from fire, actually the fire protection, that is the sprinklers, the hydrants, that is a very disjoint field. And the heart of that system is the pump room. So the pumps 
or deliver water under pressure. So if there's a sprinkler break or if I open a hose reel, the water has to come out. When the water comes out, the pressure drops. And when the pressure drops, the pumps have to go on. So looking at it, the, the bringing down of the service layer in between has given me a, pos a, a position to bring up this also into that domain. And extinguishers, extinguishers whether they are there or not and whether they are filled or not. These are the two things that have to be monitored. So that can also be brought in. So this hardware part of it in this August forum, I would just like to leave it because it's also demonstrated outside. But the main thing that is going to be of impact is the change of lifestyle. See, I would just like to bring one small example here because this is concerning safety of lives. So in, in, one, in many of the apartments that we've installed this uh, system, in a 20 floor building, which has say eight flats per floor, there are 160 kitchens and 160 puja, puja room, that is the altars where we do puja. We generally use instance, incense sticks. On an average, we have one fire per day per building. So this one fire makes the security guard extremely complacent. He says, this is going to happen, there's going to be some alarm. So if he goes and investigates, is it, it is some kitchen where there has been smoke, Indian cooking style is very, very smoke oriented. And then or puja, okay, you know, we do this tadka, you know, we take the hot oil and put mirchi on, or that is uh, chilies on that. And then uh, everybody in the house is coughing. And <laughs> But we expect the thing to be acceptable. But see, when you're living in an 18th floor, and if there is an issue, the carbon monoxide that will come out, okay, is going to create a big havoc for the entire building. And you expect the fire brigade to come and sort this out, raise a hoist up to 18 multiplied by three meters, and then penetrate your building. By the time, nothing can be saved. So the lifestyle has to gradually change. So when we started getting this one alarm per day, you know, our security guy, we called him a boss, there's an alarm, go and sort it out. So now we have started monitoring the time of restoration of a fire alarm. So if on a screen we are seeing that these many buildings have an average restoration of time of three to five minutes, that means this guy is going and getting, uh, going into the flat, ringing the bell, telling the householder that there's a fire, making her or him sign that yes, the fire was due to dust or due to a certain uh, smoke which has been created. So this has slowly brought down a lifestyle change. And this now when it is going to be provided through apps for the security guy or for the resident of the flat, there will be a whole awareness towards safety. Just like Swachh Bharat. Imagine how much the government would have spent on advertisements to create some awareness about safety. But one M2M platform, now since it is going to monitor every, every household's fire readiness levels, the, the ability to bring about a mindset change is what excites me tremendously. Thank you very much, Rosal. I guess we'll come back later with other questions. So now we're going to move to uh, Benoit. Uh, Benoit is working as uh, Associate Director in CDAC Tiruvananthapuram. Got it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which is the premier R&D organization of the, mini of the Métis. Uh, he has completed engineering graduation in computer engineering from Cochin University of Science and Technology in Kerala. He has 23 years experience in IT, which includes design, development, R&D, and implementation of the products for both uh, ITS, Intelligent Transport System, and su Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, which is otherwise known as SCADA. Uh, under his guidance, different products were released, and technology transfer has been done for most of the product with Indian companies. His present focus is on ITS, intelligent transportation domain, and released several. And he released several products for smart city deployment. So I think he is very well placed to uh, be on this panel. The floor is yours, uh, Benoit. Sorry. Okay. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank Setout for giving an opportunity to speak out uh, for uh, uh, the M uh, one M2M and the ITS products which is integrated with the one, M one M2M platform developed by CDOT. So uh, I'm from uh, Center for Development of Advanced Computing. 
uh, which is then uh, which is the R and D center of uh, Ministry of Information Technology. And uh, Indian transportation is one of the main vertical of SEDAC. And uh, we have uh, uh, and these products we have, SEDAC has developed a different products in ITS domain, and all of them having um, uh, major deployments in the smart city domain. So. Uh, the major products what we have developed one of the you know it's a ATCS ad adaptive traffic control system that having uh, three elements one is the traffic controllers that the one which we are talking today for the smart lights and uh, it is having a data acquisition system that is for the traffic monitoring and management system and another one is the uh, ATCS engine which is controls the uh, the entire traffic light um, in the city with the green corridor or a synchronization pattern. So um, all these things are right now, um, um, all the products what we have discussed is uh, TOT has been signed with Indian companies and all the TOT partners are deploying these products in the, the smart cities as well as the different uh, corporations. So the uh, why we are going uh, going to the one term uh, because we are doing all the products integrations and all with our proprietary standard. So uh, most of the uh, RFPs are coming up with the um, smart cities are asking for some standards which uh, like uh, US standard U UK standards. But even uh, these two things cannot com communicate between each other. So we are using our own protocol, uh, protocol standard. So, but um, the standards which is uh, put into the RFP, it uh, cannot uh, talk it to each other. So we are thought of putting in one standard, which is uh, actually the one m 2 is the de facto standard for the um, uh, coming up with the Nidhi Ayak. I think it will be publishing very soon. But we, we start up with the C dot. C dot is already developed the one m 2 um, common service layer. We have we had a discussion with the CDOT and we are thought of putting our products, all the transportation products. So this is the only three I mentioned here. But we have other uh, seven items, to, uh, but uh, no. So we started with the other one, you know, the one which is the ATCS one, and uh, that is um, we have started implementing with the one from platform developed by CDOT. And we have achieved within a short while, means within a one month time, we could able to um, uh, achieve uh, to make our uh, products by track, means wireless traffic control system, plus and the uh, the traffic management and software, traffic monitoring and management software to communicate with the uh, uh, CDOT's um, common service layer. So initially it was like it is directly communicating. Now the uh, the the two applications means two products which is communicating through uh, C dots uh, 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 common service layer. So uh, it is it, we have tested this one with uh, the products which is available in the stall as well as we have kept the, our uh, IoT device like the um, uh, the uh, uh, traffic controller. Uh, in CDAC to Andrum. So from there we are communicating the data and it is showing here as well. So to migrate migrate to the one m 2 platform, what we did was we have not changed anything on the product, what we did. We have made another um, ADN node, but uh, no, there is another hardware which is talking to our controller, means that it can be because we are going for a standard, the other things will be like a uh, legacy system. So we are keeping as it is, and we made another product, ADN, uh, the, that will be communicating with our um, uh, controller, and that in that is going, that is communicating with the, you know, the ADN is communicating with the um, CCSP of C, C dot, that internally communicating our tram software that is residing um, in Truandrum. So that is the mechanism we have done it. So it is very simple that you no, know, it can be integrated with the. CDAC, uh, CDOT, uh, CCSP with the any any applications like uh, no so these we we are moving to other applications of hello uh, we are moving to other uh, applications as well like uh, we have a parking solution we have the red light violation uh, detection system we have um, uh, emergency vehicle prioritization system and we have um, pedestrian safety enhancement controller all these products we are planning to put into our one m platform. 
so uh, the integration is very easy so so it can be done within a short while and these all the things will be finally we are going to deploy in the um, uh, smart city um, uh, deployments which is already happened in different cities like in a bhubaneswar our, our system is already running with the you know track tram and cosi cost so we are planning for that as well with the zero uh, one amdm platform thank you I'd like to propose something to the audience. If somebody has a question for the speaker, maybe the question should come from the audience. If you don't, I'll ask a question. Can, does anyone have a question for Benoit at this point? Okay, I'll ask a question. <laughs> uh, you talk about a number of uh, um, things that have been deployed in CDAC, also in working with CDOT. Are there... Uh, indigenous or Indian products available on the market already? And the product, uh, all the products what, what I have discussed here, all are indigenous. It's all made by us only, when SIDAC products. So uh, there are different other products are available in the market in the globally as well as in Indi Indian products. But uh, right now, um, in the most of the RFPs are coming up with SIDAC products. Okay, so because of that is indigenous. So, um, make in India. Thank you. We'll come back to this. Our third speaker is going to be Sharad Arora, who founded uh, Sensorized Digital Services with the purpose of bringing end-to-end -end technology and telco-agnostic IoT and M2M solution which is a, a technology and telco agnostic is a, is, a, is a phrase that is dear to a standardizer's heart. Um, Sensorize, uh, Sharad will explain much better than me, but Sensorize addresses complex industry issues using technology, agility, experience, and collaboration. Uh, in partnership with ITI, uh, he has contributed to the Swatch Bharat mission with devices and portals that have led to greater accountability and cleanliness in public conveniences. And Sensorai works pro bono for the social sector. I think it's um, um, notable, something to be noted. Uh, prior to founding Sensorai, Sharad was the chief officer for wireless solution at Tata Teleservice Services. And before that, he spent 10 years with a Swedish security and mobile service company. Did I read well? Swedish? Smartress. <laughs> okay. Swedish. Swedish. <laughs> And, and, and something in your bio which has struck me is that you won the Duke of Edinburgh Gold Award for your achievement in sports. That's correct too. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Margot. I think one of the challenges that Margot set for us is to somehow keep this session live, keep it uh, interactive. So I think uh, also I must bear in mind the three minutes well, I'm not here with any 1M, 2M spiel, I'm not here with any platform. I think what I would say in the two, three minutes is uh, I have worked very closely with uh, many standards and technical reports, at least half a dozen of them. Uh, we've had two submissions to ITU. And I think most times when we have uh, participated with, let's say, smart cities, our request to them as with the regulator, as with policy makers, is to first focus on large, scale, already at scale problems. And this matter came up for a question at our lunch discussion that shouldn't standards actually be made prior to problems, become problems. So I think one of those uh, things with IoT and M2M, that uh, my understanding of standards with IoT and M2M is that unlike I was explaining at the lunch, unlike ITU, unlike telecoms, we've come from a time when a new switch release was a 15, 20 year exercise. And uh, the nature of problem that we have found, I used to be Mr. Ratan Tata's Innovation Council and very proud of my uh, capabilities in telecoms. I was also um, an InnoVista uh, lead uh, assessor. And I had this uh, occasion when uh, the CFO of Jaguar Land Rover was on the same panel as I, and we were assessing some innovation. And he said, one of the problems I hear about for my cars coming to India is that they cannot be provisioned. I said, what do you mean they cannot be provisioned? He said, we have started to use embedded SIMs, 
and I can't provision it. So without really knowing what it was, Metro standards, I said, no problem, we'll fix it. And then seven, eight months later, we realized that there was absolutely zero collaboration, zero possibility of. So we actually set up Sensorize, a part of fulfilling that promise. We are credit, credited today to have brought the embedded SIM to the market. We built that technology locally. I think the interesting thing about chasing problems, chasing solutions, or solutions chasing problems, when we built what we built, a quality of service solution on the SIM, guess who came after us? Telcos and DOT. How could you have built something that does what is called a multi-profile card, even before standards have specified it? So I think one of our learnings has been that uh, in the process of solving the real life problems, uh, standards at times come late. Good news today is that uh, GSMA, after a few meetings at the Mobile World Congress, uh, has amended its specifications. So one of the things that we do, for example, today now, is to put up to five profiles on a single card and make the card intelligently sense whether there is a network or not. And where there is no network, switch it to the next available network. And that is what we call COSIM. But also, I think this product uh, made a lot of difference to the AIS 140 standard. Maybe two minutes for that. Uh, AIS 140 is an Indian standard, which uh, has led to a standard way of putting vehicle tracking devices in public service vehicles. It was a territory occupied by all types of system integrators, no care for GSMA certification, none of the terminal firmwares were certified, but a good public policy and a good articulation of standards. Somebody last uh, time had mentioned an SOP. So an SO5354 was written by the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, a standard operating procedure followed by an AIS-140 standard. And if you go and check today, there have been news now that vehicles are fitted with alarms, vehicles are fitted with tracking devices. It's given the industry a uniform, scalable, interoperable method of public safety. So I think it can bring, uh, standardization can bring real big uh, benefits and I do agree, I've been a great fan of 1M2M. I've read a lot of the standards like uh, night reading and uh, I think it's a very, very powerful aggregation of common service layer, device management, interoperability, sharing of data and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charad. The, the question of the timing of standardization is one that uh, keeps us up at night, even if personally I don't read standards on night reading. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman with his hands uh, raised up it means he has a question for Sharad. No? It was just. Has anyone? Uh, uh, Vipin, you have a question for Sharad. Is there a microphone? They don't expect action so little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, guys. Move. <laughs> yeah. I should be the last person asking question as a host. But uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. But what I actually wanted to see was that people getting out of their uh, segment and asking questions and the inputs from the other segment. It means that what do you need from FIRE to run uh, you know, your own uh, solution much better? Or what is required by traffic lights to operate much better from uh, the traffic management? I'm sure TDAC has all of that, so they will build it now that they have the one M2M. But the real discussion will be more interesting if we start using the use cases of others for the benefit of our own segment. So that was the question. You, you, so, and you have worked extensively. Yeah, so, so you felt need some time? Yes, in fact, the fact that we today enable more than 400,000 public service vehicles with what? We brought mission critical connectivity, but the use of a, a tamper-proof element, a use of a tamper-proof element sitting as a connectivity element is the flagship use in AIS-140. 
that you can identify a device by having a method of communicating to the to the device and you can I, you can you can uniquely identify a device not because of a device attribute but because of the fact that ICC ID and IMZ is unique and that is soldered and that is tamper proof. I would just like to add in a, a small uh, because it's very relevant to what sir asked. It's like I had an experience in one of the Delhi flyovers. My car caught fire. It was an old Zylo and the driver didn't understand. There was smoke inside. So that time, I said fire-ready cars are extremely important. And I just fell short of using that uh, during my this thing. But he's done something very strong in the automobile. I strongly recommend him to also think about fire-ready cars. Luckily, the car had an extinguisher. So we poured, uh, we poured the liquid from the gas from the extinguisher into the engine. The, the, the fire didn't stop. Then there was a guy carrying bottles of water, this 15, 20 liter bottles of water. He helped us. He poured all his drinking water into the engine. That's how the fire stopped. We were so worried that it may explode. So there is an, this is how 1M2M can play. So if this fire readiness idea just sinks into them, so they make all the provisions required for it. And we just have fire ready cars everywhere. So we can see how many cars are fire ready de today in Delhi. So. Margot, can I, I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Certainly. Am I allowed? Thank you. My question is to all of you together. Uh, more or less, all of you have now, by now, have experienced one after uh, whether the benefits or maybe the shortcomings, which you might not have articulated so far. Do you see, in your remotest thought, any application which might not be implementable using 1M2M in the IoT ecosystem? That this is something which is relevant, yet not implementable, so that we can address that at the, at the standards level. And if they are, so how do you think that 1M2M should be promoted to be the standard which we all are looking for, but is becoming elusive? Well, our experience is, um, for the data analytics uh, platform, uh, we have interfaced with 1M2M over uh, uh, one time implementation. So we had no problems in that. And uh, uh, probably I think the other uh, IoT vendors can say about any particular application which is not uh, amenable to 1M2M. Uh, no, I think uh, in whatever work we have been working with CDOT for about maybe 15 months now. And today, just at lunch, we have uh, identified to ourselves a method for authentication using the secure keys inside a SIM card, for instance. And I think more generally, it is, a, it is impossible to answer that question in a yes, because that standard is an assimilation of all the nice things that must come together in the IoT M2M space. So very hard to say or identify anything that can go missing from the benefits of one M2M. So come to the second. I, an, I almost anticipated the first part of the question because I know it. Now come to my second part of the question. What now should we do to make this a national standard which has been eluding us for quite a few years? We have been attempting towards that. If no application is not attainable through 1M2M, why shouldn't it be the national standard on which all these applications should reside? May I? <coughs> I think in that particular area, this experience of AIS 140, which you can read you know, easily on the web with the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, is a very simple answer. And that is, it is vital that policy makers have a good understanding of what is required. And once that answer is uh, there, I think one of, the, one of the questions I sent up to Mar uh, Margot was to basically examine what is required to uh, sort of balance what is a mandate and what is a standard. It is uh, very, very clear to us that either the Ministry of uh, housing, housing and Urban Development or the Ministry of Communications has to mandate that in order to prevent disorderly proliferation of applications and data management, because eventually, five years, 10 years later, it's the whole monetization is about data. 
in order to prevent that from a disorderly state of uh, uh, proliferation, uh, this has to be mandated. I, I think it's a, a very simple answer that collectively the smart cities, the smart transport, the smart agriculture, the smart health have to get together to say this is a minimum requirement. And then the standard is has to be there, otherwise we'll not, have a, uh, we'll not be able to share uh, um, all the data from different applications. And uh, smarts, I mean, I, um, we'll not have any smartness in the cities at all. Yeah, I got the answer data. from Sharad that mandating is the way to go. Yeah. So what recommendation should go from the industry is for mandating this as a standard, rather than leaving it as is so that people will go in their own proprietary way. If you don't mandate it, it will continue to happen in a uh, chaotic way the way it has been happening over the years. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And indeed part of the conversation at lunch, if I remember correctly, was about these, uh, what the person, Mr. Prakash from the, um, it was in, in Bangalore last week, Mr. Prakash from METI, the Secretary of METI, METI. Uh, the person who was supposed to attend yesterday? No, 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 yeah. it was, it was, well, it was a very brilliant presentation. And he talked about the, the, the different uh, digital public platforms that India was uh, putting together. He mentioned Alhar, he mentioned UPI, he mentioned... Wahan. Wahan. Thank you. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm asking myself the question, it's really an open question, if, if this uh, UID, IUDX based on 1M2M is not the next one, which, which could integrate all these different, um, all these different things which means not necessarily mandate the standard, but mandate the referencing the standard in public procurement. That's but anyway, um, we are, we are, we are taking time, floor time from um, Shiganesh. And, and Shiganesh may actually, uh, you were a bit too fast for us, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chiagi, because this is what Shiganesh is, go is gonna be tasked to do on this panel, is to take it from the data angle, which is precisely this cross silo thing, et cetera. So Shriganesh Rao's experience spans across leading IT organizations such as Tata Consulting Services and IBM, telecom service provider like Optus from Australia and Tata Teleservices, telecom OEM like Bharat Electronics, United Telecoms and ERG in Australia, and so forth and so on. He's currently the managing director of Caligo Technologies at Bangalore, and he's gonna tell us about the uh, precisely data management and data to decilo all these different applications. Floor is yours. Thanks, Madhur. Uh, as we know, like now with the advent of uh, 5G, it is going to give a lot of uh, lot of connectivity everywhere, and this will amount to huge amount of data which will be uh, which will be generated. And uh, we know that I think data is the next oil and uh, it is very, very important to create value from, from the data. This value from the data can be either monetized or it can be shared with, uh, or the actionable insights from this can be shared with uh, other applications. So in a scenario like a city, uh, to make a city smart, we have multiple uh, uh, verticals like uh, it could be utility, uh, water, waste management, health, transport, traffic management, etc. And each of these departments have their own IT systems and uh, uh, they are working in independently in silos. Uh, the whole idea of making the city smart is to get data from all this into a common, into a common platform, analyze the data and uh, bring out analytics into this and actionable insights which could be used uh, for uh, actions into different verticals, like any data which is generated by a particular uh, a vertical can, uh, can have a bearing on some other, uh, uh, some other vertical. So this is where the various verticals of the city can get integrated, and it's very important that only with the data sharing this integration can happen. So this is where big, anal uh, big data analytics comes into play, and uh, 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 we at Caligo, we are in the business of high performance computing and big data analytics uh, based on AI and deep learning. And uh, um, uh, so, uh, um, for example, uh, if I had to give an example, uh, taking forward from what I, my earlier speaker talked about the transport on the vehicles, 
so connector vehicles itself generates huge amount of data because there is data coming out from the electronics of the vehicle which is uh, which will give the health of the vehicle this data could be of importance to the manufacturer to analyze the um, the way the vehicle is actually performing it might also be important to the uh, service garage to know when the vehicle has to be serviced next uh, um, and uh, uh, for the for the predictive maintenance and uh, also it could be of use for uh, and then we can have data from external sensors like for uh, weather uh, weather or the secu or the cameras uh, which sees the other vehicles in the road and then there can be data coming out from uh, uh, from the other uh, agencies uh, on, on the weather conditions and things like that. So uh, a huge amount of data is created in a vehicle itself. So this data and there are different applications uh, which will be monitoring, which will be requiring this uh, kind of data. So uh, suppose if each of these applications uh, look at this in a different way, then so much, so many IoT uh, solutions has to be designed. So, so this is where, like you know, if all this could be kind of, uh, uh, if we have a common design, which uh, where the data comes to a, a particular common standard, then different applications can use the same data from the same platform, and uh, and uh, I, I actually bring out the insights and do their application part of it. I mean, uh, they work uh, part of it. So, uh, so data sharing is absolutely important for making the city smart and uh, so this is where we need a, a, a common services platform and uh, I, uh, like you know from our own analytics platform uh, the way we used to work is uh, uh, we had to uh, we had to kind of work with every solution provider to understand their implementation and then we had to write our wrappers to integrate with their uh, with the solution so this had to this was actually custom made and had to be well, we had to work with every Every uh, with uh, every IoT vendor, but now if we uh, if we have all the uh, IoT solutions uh, uh, bringing out to a common standard, then our interface is only to a common standard. So that makes things very easy, and then we'll be able to scale. And again, the uh, the IoT solution vendors also will be able to scale because uh, what uh, solution and application they uh, they write once, they'll be able to replicate across different domains. They'll be able to take it uh, globally anywhere. So their return on investment will be very much fast and they'll be able to monetize this. I have a question you. for you. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question for you. Uh, because this, this, this issue is similar to what we sometimes experience in standardization where we, we, we need to address and we increasingly address more and more what we call verticals, which is by the way a very bad word in my opinion. Uh, but in, in what you're saying is that, okay, the, the technical capability is going to be there for data to be reusable by such and such sector, mm -hmm. but there needs to be an impulse for these people to talk to each other. Yes. So uh, does this have to come from the people who are big in a solution for, for uh, uh, embedded SIM in vehicles or for somebody who is coming from a, a, a smart street light, et cetera, or does it, is this a role for the, uh, for the um, um, policy makers? Uh, I would say this is a role for the policymaker to look at a holistic picture of the entire uh, entire country, because all the cities had to be designed for same interoperability. Any solution which is designed and working very well in a particular city should be able to be replicated in any other city. So this should be the the overall uh, um, work of, of of the top uh, policymaker. Sorry, I will be quick, but uh, our experience says that the, maybe it's not very clear why the role of the policy. When we collect public data, and that public data in a mashup and bashup of applications and analytics is going to benefit a fire tender, uh, an ambulance, and multiple stakeholders, the reason policy comes into play is because the information sharing has to be responsible and secure. The reason for public policy is that, right? As opposed to developing business, you mean? Yes, as as opposed to a business decision or a business model related uh, collaboration, has to be open, has to be open, secure, secure, and responsibly shared. Right, and along with the security, and data has to be anonymized. So this is where we have implemented our analytics platform to anonymize the data so that we can filter out all the personal information from 
from the data which is being received and only use the data for certain uh, requirement of the of the state so i have a small point to add here this also will evolve in the sense from the look from the perspective of fire for example now fire readiness monitoring will require so many other from so much of help from so many other so when i'm sitting and thinking how do i make something else fire ready and i say i want this data and if the one m2m server already has it so i just make it so it evolves kind of it's not it cannot be just the responsibility of the statutory authority or the enforcement agencies or the city it can just if the data is available people will as well use it with their imagination and bring out and that will again become a new standard kind of or enhance the 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 buckets or the resource tree or whatever yeah may i ask one question here uh, to the on the omnibus with gdpr coming smart cities have been around in india we have just uh, four five years ago we started but smart cities have been world over have been there and in eu gdpr has come in a big way now what is the impact of gdpr coming on the smart cities phenomena instead of in in in, in arena of sharing the data and so many things we are talking here so could somebody enlighten us what impact gdpr law created on the iot scenario or smart city scenario personal data is not used so data is ano it has to be anonymized so personal data has to be anonymized no that's true sir yeah. one, you said it's being anonymized that's one impact yes appreciated probably had that not been there this anonymization would have not occurred any other thing else is that the only thing impact or the uh, some fines have been imposed on the i mean the people have withdrawn because of the fear <laughs> of gdpr i mean that kind of a total picture innovation is one aspect of it there has Agreed. not been to my knowledge there has not been any fines yet which can go up to 4% of the total revenue so people are companies are quite 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 um um and i say cautious about this GPR came into force um, last year or one year ago. One year ago, yeah. So I uh, the, the, little it, early to ask this question. As it as it names says, uh, general data protection uh, regulation. It's actually personal data protection. Yeah, but so IoT, um, it, let me finish. Yeah. <laughs> let me. Uh, okay. So uh, first of all, it, it concerns only the, the the personal data, which which means probably much of the it does not touch upon much of the data that has been discussed here in this panel. But I think you're right. There is a it's a, it's an interesting question of it's it actually re relates to some of the question there was in the last panel about security. To a certain, we also have a very good expert of GDPR and security here uh, from the European Union. Um, um, it's true that sometimes the, 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 the objectives of business development and regulation can be antagonistic, right? As it happens in Europe, uh, da personal data protection is a fundamental right. So you have, to, you have to be aware of this, to play with this, to make sure that you respect this, because otherwise the fines can be extremely, extremely high. And, and well, it might be disruptive to the business. It is disruptive to the business of, uh, it's like security is disruptive to the business of IoT, as we heard in the last panel. Now, I'm not among the people who say that privacy is overrated because it, it prevents doing business. It, for me, it's a, a little bit like if you are saying security is overrated, let's sell uh, a, any kind of gear we can. So uh, I think all these applications will have to take this into account. But again, uh, um, this, the, the, the privacy regulation in Europe only addresses personal, GDPR only addresses personal data. Uh, one line of response to what you said. Uh, I don't know whether it's right for me to say that I, I, I may like to differ with the uh, observation you made just now because eventually sooner or later it's very difficult to make a fine delineation between personal data and as a user of the smart city be it a connected car or a traffic lights when I move personally my face recognition I mean so many things are happening where my personal characteristics get profiled so how do we really uh, while we are techies are talking about standards techie are talking about so many things Activists will be talking outside, in outside in uh, the how their personal lives are getting impacted, and they will be 
uh, using the tool of GDPR. And we are also soon going to have a parallel GDPR in our country also, maybe this year, next year. Already framework is in place. That uh, The draft law is in place. Parliament has to sit and pass it after a bit of stakeholder consultation. So slowly things will come out. Maybe it is too, too early to anticipate, but may I differ here with you that uh, personal data can be separated in a smart city, in IoT arena, because we also use are the users, as Mr. Tyagi said in the morning and the afternoon session, watch, the sense of variables, so many things we use, and uh, may personal I, data gets involved. Mago, may I? Sure, sure. Mm. Yes, sir. Um, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. No, 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 you're not wrong, but. Um, I would say the question is a question of uh, who is in charge of uh, the data collection and um, uh, if this person or entity is in charge um, it's better if there is someone which is trustable like uh, uh, public administration than to uh, have different actors uh, you don't obviously master of what they can do with the data. Um, and you can, how do say, uh, you can put with this um, public sector administration, you can put a, a, a trustworthy um, solution like a certificate, like a blockchain, which can also register all of these different transactions. If you can't collect on just one point, you will have very, very much difficulties to find out uh, where is the data and to uh, be uh, compliant to the GDPR, which asks you to be able to erase all the data at the customer demand. So if you don't know where it is, you know to er erase it. So on my point of view, it's, it may be a solution. Don't, don't stay too far from the mic because it's going to be your turn. I think we, we got a few minutes left. No, but I, just, to, just to finish on this, all these are, are problem in action or let's say working in progress. Of course, this, this impacts, this impacts um, each and everything impacts on, on the other. And, and we heard this also in the, in the previous session about security. Um, Christophe, you're going to be last to sort of try and wrap up because, so everybody knows Christophe, I'm not going to introduce him again because he was introduced uh, in the last session. Basically, you, all you have to know is that he's the grand wazoo of uh, Bordeaux uh, smart city and Bordeaux is a very nice, I don't live in Bordeaux, but I use Bordeaux quite a lot. It's a very nice and very user-friendly city, including with the uh, services and application that he's, he and his team have put together. Uh, and uh, he has three minutes to say something completely different from what he has told you so far. So <laughs> okay, I will, yeah, the challenge is okay. So why, why, I would say, why standardization is essential for uh, the public sector, for the cities? The answer is very simple, because we are not skilled enough to describe technically what we need. We can put uh, the needs on the paper, but we, we are not skilled enough to describe technical features and um, you know that the public sector needs procurements to ask the private sector to, to work and it's very simple for us to just to write in the technical specification we have to be compliant to this kind of specification so to this standard to this technical specification um, in the case of the smart city uh, it's m more difficult because you address different uh, domains like water management, electricity, EV charging. So it's, it's difficult and more difficult than just addressing one domain. Uh, and if I hear to my colleagues from the working group I manage in EuroCities, so EuroCities, just very quickly, it's a uh, the network of uh, 140 biggest cities in Europe. Uh, I manage a, a working group on standardization and interoperability. They just ask me for standards to write in the procurements, and that's it. That's all they need. Uh, and the last but not the least, why 1M2M? 1M2M is this cross-sectorial answer 
to to give to the to the providers to be able to have a solution which may manage water meters uh, EV charges smart lighting and so on and so far so I think I was short enough less than three minutes there is an incentive for this no yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> dear in two minutes um, I think this uh, thank you very much Christophe I think this conversation could could last uh, much longer because there's a very interesting issue in what Christophe just said, uh, the, which is which is also a question we ask ourselves. Well, the, the, there is a food chain between having an idea, then the idea becomes a use case, and then to transform this into requirements, to transform this into te uh, uh, technical specification, then you have to test, pilot, etc. And the 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 language, even the language used by different communities, has to be translated along the food chain. And it's something, so this is a very interesting, and how do you make this a feedback loop also? Once the thing is on the market, how do you feed it back into the process so that it, the thing grows and, and lives? That's a very interesting thing. We also touched upon the timing of standardization, which is also quite, quite of the, uh, in French we would say, la quadrature du cercle. So how do you make a circle square, basically? Um, um, the role of uh, regulators and how to use uh, data to make sure that the thing is uh, DC load because this is where the, mo the biggest value is going to come from. I think we could we could discuss much more. Uh, we uh, we it's six fifteen. What? Yeah, we should conclude in the next five minutes. Okay. So the next five minutes, I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to work for myself. Uh, if in this food chain, which is standardization, let's say, let's say 20 years ago, the GSM times, roughly, it was very much a, an exercise between peers. They knew how to talk to each other. It was business to business, etc. And they, they, there was no problem of, tr of lost in translation, right? I'm sure Sharad can, can live with it. Today we see we have to talk to people who are not, uh, it's, it's become increasingly a business to consumer discipline with the digitization of everything. And, and, we, and we, uh, we are not very good, and I say this, is Luis in the room? Luis is my boss. <laughs> we are not very good at that. And so I would like uh, from each of you one piece of advice of how could standard development organizations in general, but Etsy in particular, because I care more about Etsy, uh, how could we better address cities and, and car manufacturers and, and traffic light or ITS people? ITS, we have quite a lot in Etsy, but still, and so forth and so on, to make sure that the, 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 the value proposition of, of discussing this together and probably uh, inputting their use case and their requirements could be better sold. If you can, each of you give me an idea, I, I, <laughs> I, get, I get what I need. <laughs> I will start. So um, I think the solution is to to bring on board all the stakeholders uh, interested in this domain. So private, public sector, utilities. Perhaps create a new a new smart city group. Thank you, Margot. I think uh, when asked that question of HC, I, we respect at sea from 30 years. I've been a telecoms man and uh, learned more or less everything through reading standards. But I think at sea must address and 3GPP must address stakeholders beyond telecom operators. I think your focus rightfully has been the telecom operators, but the role has tremendously changed. And one of the uh, submissions we are making to ITU is a submission about how to make the GBA, HC GBA, work for non-telcos. So I think if you could look at that, which is to shift your focus from TSPs or MNOs to any services provider. Regarding the ITS domain, so there are standards is available. I previously um, I told that no the NTCIP UG 405 kind of thing, but there is no common one till now. It is not arised. It is like some US, U UK kind of uh, different uh, countries. It is taking some standards. So like one M two M one standard comes, it can be applicable for all the the entire country means the entire world if it is with the one one standard 
then that will be you know the interoperability interchangeability everything can be applied so i'm i'm i have a very drastically different take on this so my suggestion is like instead of going to those car manufacturers and whoever whoever other manufacturers i would suggest that more effort should be put on orienting the public orienting the public about the benefits of one m2m reasonably educated public because one m2m according to me from what i have understood if i have understood correctly will have a huge socio cultural impact so it's about so many other things which i don't want to talk here which dr paul timmers <laughs> yesterday has very beautifully and very very beautifully and lucidly presented i think that captures the entire uh, this one so who is going to bring about whatever has been spoken about it's going to be the governments and the public and unless and until the public stand for this unless and until people like me who are householders who are citizens who are living in in uh, in apartments people r running offices they are ready to open up i wanted to add one which is very pertinent here he had asked about this uh, data regulation personal data regulation standard i say i really commend what mr christopher said because it's better to do it through a trustworthy agency rather than letting it happen if you don't do it it's going to happen it's already happened all of us know it so it's a choice which is according to me a very black and white choice there's no nothing to think about it's better that it happens through deliberations through proper government forums rather than just allowing it to happen the way it has happened in the past 20 years i say i say that the infatuation with internet and hardware should end now and it's time to look at data hardware technology in a more mature sustainable and uh, 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 a <laughs> secure way and that i think only governments can do when we have given our armies nuclear arsenal to the governments why not data we have to do it otherwise it will anyway get taken so my another small point is that all the people who have developed products around m2m one m2m should become mascots i was talking to mr roland i really <laughs> spoke to him for around one one and a half hours standing outside here i told him that you know people who have developed products the hundreds of companies who have developed products they and their employees can be given certain points some credit points for spreading one m2m awareness amongst close groups of people whom they can influence this would bring about and this would bring about a lasting change and this is also for the public to understand not just the the law makers the public should understand this and then automatically law makers will be propelled to implement this and automatically the bigger stakeholders the jaguars and all those people who have so much of repository of knowledge would add on this because it doesn't have hardware cost it's just software so that's i that's how i think it should happen thanks a lot well let's see has been doing uh, very good work in creating awareness of one uh, mtm and also conducting many one and two workshops uh, in few cities so probably i think uh, this could be increased and create awareness among a larger iot ecosystem it will be it will be very good and also it's we will have to see how as to how to certify devices and applications as one and two m uh, um, aware or uh, one and two m compliant that's very important and also bring out more uh, uh, awareness on the data privacy especially on on uh, on things like facial recognitions and uh, you know on this area on the personal data okay. thank you thank you very much these are very interesting points that i'm taking with pleasure um unless there is a burning desire to ask a question or make a comment i think this panel is coming to an end i would like to thank very much the panelists for the good job and i hope you uh, enjoyed I would like to thank all our eminent speakers for their enriching talks. Let me now request Mr. Vipin Tyagi, Executive Director CDOT, to present a token of thanks and gratitude to the esteemed members of this panel.
Ms. Margot Do, Director, Strategy Development, European Telecommunication Standards Institute, ETSI. Mr. Christoph Collinet, Smart City Project Manager, Bordu Metropole. Mr. Binoy Gopal, Associate Director, Intelligent Transportation and Networking Station, Center for Development of Advanced Computing, CDAC. Mr. Sharath Arora, Founder and Managing Director, Sensorized Digital Services, Private Limited. Mr. Shri Ganesh Rao, Managing Director, Caligo Technologies. Mr. Prasad Parshuraman, CEO Pyrox ICT Private Limited. I would like to further inform you that all the information and updates about the conference are available on our website www.cdot.in under the section Latest Updates. May I now request Mr. Vipin Thyagi, Executive Director CDOT, for the concluding remarks and the formal closing of CDOT's 36th Foundation Day celebrations. So, uh, good evening everybody. Almost evening. Okay, uh, what, what a action-packed couple of days. I think in the lives of the technologists, rarely you get these couple of days with so much of diverse knowledge, so much deep knowledge, having all the luminaries come from all over the world and deliberate on the issues which are absolutely relevant for, for the folks here. So I must compliment uh, each and every one here and I want all of you to get up, whether it is a, you know, somebody who is mixing the sound, whether cameraman, everybody should be up and clap for ourselves. Or, you know, sustaining. This is the way to go. This is how technology will be built in India. This is how we will progress the standard. This is how we are going to change the game together with the energy in this hall and outside. This is the way to go. Thank you very much. I, uh, you know, declare the conference closed. But the tea is still on, right? Tea is still on. <laughs>